have finished my final exams in June and have caught a few tips to give out on how to study for exams. This video is broken down into three parts. The first part is know what to study. The second part is how to know what to study. And the last part will be one additional pro tip that I really like. To answer the question how to study, the first thing we have to figure out is what to study. The biggest mistake I've ever made is studying topics in sequence. I have a sense of perfection that tries to study everything in order because it makes me feel organized. The problem is because the first few chapters are usually easier and shorter, when I finish them faster than I expected, I have an illusion that the following chapters are going to take me a similar amount of time. So I'll do additional studying for the first few chapters, like looking at references, doing extra summaries and making pretty notes. But in reality, the extra studies I did are unnecessary, and they use up my study time for the later chapters that are much more longer and complex. To find out which topic you should work on, the question you should ask yourself is what's the topic I'm fear with the most? That will answer guide what you need to study. This ensures you're studying with the topics you're least happy with, and that your time won't be wasted on going through topics that you know you're familiar with, but you just go through them anyway because it makes you feel confident and prepared. You have to fill in the gaps in your knowledge and invest your time in what you don't know but not what you know because you're going to lose marks on things you don't know and you're not going to score bonus marks for things you know. Now, you can picture an exam as an egg structure. The egg is made up of egg yolk, egg white, and egg shell. The center is the egg yolk, which is the high yield material that's most likely to appear in the exam. The surrounding layer is the egg white which theoretically exists, and it's possible to see them in exam, but the chance of occurrence is much more smaller than egg yolk. The egg shell, which is the outermost layer, is what makes the boundary of the content. The egg content is never going to expand beyond the egg shell since it's restricted inside and can never escape. And the egg shell is what we always heard as learning objectives. Sometimes we feel we need to learn extra content to stand out in exam. These are things like the deep questions you're asking in lectures and the finest details of the details. But the truth is, your university has a defined curriculum on what can be tested. In usual lectures and workshops, lecturers and students are free to explore beyond the curriculum in their own time. Students are encouraged to ask more and learn more, and that's good because it's about the curiosity and the eagerness to search for an answer, and there's never a boundary in learning. However, it's not about that kind of learning when it comes to studying for exams. Exam has a solid and rigid boundary which restricts what can be tested. It's a material that the school thinks is important and wants you to know, not what you think is important or you want to know. Remember this, exam can't test you anything beyond the curriculum because it's not allowed. So how do we find the egg yolk, egg white, and the egg shell of exam? The first quick tip is to ask seniors for advice. You could shoot them a DM and start the conversation with open-ended questions like Hi, may I ask you for some advice about the exam of this unit? And would you mind to share with me how you study for this unit? In my case, I have a comprehensive care unit which we are taught the pathophysiology, chemistry, mechanisms of medicines, and management of six diseases respectively. So I've got quite a lot on my plate for one single disease. Say the disease I'm studying is asthma. Now which subtopic should I focus on? And especially for the management part, there is a difference between a straightforward question that asks, describe the overall management of asthma versus a case problem in which I'm given a specific patient and I'm asked to devise an asthma treatment plan for this patient. So from the experience that's shared by my senior mentor, I know that the exam is more inclined to test students on the management of disease compared to pathophysiology, chemistry, and mechanisms of action of medicines. Within the management subtopic, the question types focus less on rote learning and lean more towards case solving. This helps me a lot in terms of prioritizing topics and subtopics that I have to study. It's good if we know a few or many of our seniors because they can reach out to all of them, ask them if they can spend a few minutes to chat with you, and learn from their personal experience. But hey, wait a second, what if I don't know any seniors? Don't worry, I'm one of the introverted students who don't know any seniors as well. Except my senior mentor. Yes, if you don't know any senior, you should have at least known one senior mentor in your freshman year who is likely pre-assigned to you by university. Now, let's move on to practice paper and discuss what's the best time to do them. Doing practice paper is always the best form of practice because it's using active recall, that is, retrieving content from your brain, having the same format with the exam, 
and the questions are written exactly by the professors who are going to write your actual exam. If you have multiple practice papers, do all of them, at least as much as you could. You could spread out the practice paper session in your schedule according to your needs. So for example, when you have got one week left and you have three practice paper, you could spread the session out by doing one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, and the last one on Friday. This ensures you're getting practice from a mixture of content you have studied and haven't studied. Every now and then, it forces your brain to work hard, helps you to identify any missing gaps, and refreshes your memory. The main point is, do not do a new set of practice paper just the day before exam. I know a lot of people talk about doing as much practice as you can at the last day of exam, so you can kind of get into the flow and write on that flow until the actual exams rolls back. I personally find that unhelpful, because whenever you do a practice paper, there's so much to learn. There are some weird questions that you never seen or expected. There are like new points mentioned only in the marking scheme. It feels so bad when you find out that there's still something you don't understand, something new to learn just a day before your exam. On the other hand, if you just get one practice paper from the uni, just like me, then you will eventually ask a question. What should I do it? Should I do it before or after finishing my study? The answer from it is do it at one third of your study journey. For example, I have got four exams in June this year, and I have got one practice paper for each exam. I finished all four of the practice paper on the 1st of June, which is six days before the exam. I could choose to do the practice paper for my last subject just two days before my last exam, but I didn't because I use the practice paper to guide my direction of study more than to test my preparation. It's better to know the exam format as early as possible. The least thing you want to experience is studying loads of things, doing your practice paper after feeling done for your study, and find out that it's not what you expected. <laughs> to summarize, the earlier you do the practice paper, the more it serves to provide you directions to study. The later you do your practice paper, the more it serves to test your knowledge. If you have multiple practice paper, insert them into your study schedule according to your needs so you can be guided and tested along your study. But avoid doing a new set of practice paper on the last day before exam. If you have only one practice paper, it's always better to do it at the one third of your journey and let it guide your study to the right track. The third tip is to use learning objectives as a guide and focus on the general. Learning objectives allows you to understand the topic from a wide-angle perspective. When I study a topic, I used to focus on very nitty-gritty details, trying to seek answers for every question I could think of. There's nothing wrong with this inquisitive attitude, but we're talking about exams, not about lifelong learning nor doing research. Getting hung up on a certain detail makes you lose your sight in the big picture, and you're not going to have enough time to study all of your topics if you try to be perfect on every tiny details. The exam, indeed, is always focusing on the general. Have you ever had the feeling that the question is so general that you don't know what to write? It's something like this. After you've read a whole page of detailed physiology of a disease, you have got too much information in your brain to a point where you don't know what you should talk about. And you see something like this in your exam. Describe the area changes and key role players of asthma. You know immediately what the question is referring to, but the question is so general that you're not sure what to answer. So you write as much as you could and hoping some of the points are going to hit the marking scheme. If you can relate to that, comment down below. <laughs> try this. Before studying, try to estimate the mark allocation for each topic in the exam by doing a simple calculation. For example, I have 6 topics for a unit. My exam for that unit lasts for 2.5 hours and it has a total mark of 100. That means each topic gets approximately 25 minutes and carries 70 marks. So see, the professors could only dedicate a limited portion of marks to each topic, and they just don't have enough mark capacity for every single question. So what questions are they trying to put on exams? The general questions, because this is the only way to ensure students are being tested on the main important concepts. How can we, as students, predict questions like that? Learning objectives is your best friend in putting yourself in professors' shoes and see things through their lenses. They are an excellent source of broad and general questions that you can use to test yourself. You may not have enough time to write or type out the answers for each learning objectives, but you could try to run through the main points for each of them in your mind. 
at the last part of the video, here's a sneaky tip for using learning objectives and practice exams. Pay attention to the keywords of learning objectives, like understand, describe, apply, and see how questions come up in the practice exam. For example, understanding perhaps underpins that you need to understand the fundamentals in order to have a good understanding of the topic. It's like a prerequisite to understand the topic, but itself is not being tested. Another obvious example would be apply versus describe wordings. Say you have learned time management principles. A learning objective that asks you to describe the main principles requires you to explain the principle in your own words. But a learning objective that asks to apply the main principles doesn't require you to explain the principles, but you are likely given a case and write down actual suggestions. With this tip, however, we don't know whether it's a random or an intentional choice of word, and that's why you should compare the learning objectives with the practice exam questions to analyze the format and how they come up. I hope you have learned some useful tips in today's video. I still have to do as a disclaimer that the things I've shared today do not necessarily fit everyone because everyone has their own set of experience and methods, but I would be very happy if you find this one helpful. Comment down below how do you study for exams and share your experience. And yeah, good luck for your exam and I will see you in the next video.